Hello, heroes and headless horsemen. My name is TB's Guy, and welcome back to the Boss Designs of Dark Souls 2, where it won't have been that long since the last video for you guys, but it's been a good long while for me since I last sat down to play the game because, well, I recorded quite a lot of footage for this thing all in one go. However, before we go searching for any more bosses, and I have a pretty good idea of where I might find one, there's something that uh, needs to be done. Because, as you may have noticed over the course of the last few videos, I've sort of been growing more and more dissatisfied with the fact that despite not really wanting to, I am once again wearing relatively heavy armor, swinging a giant sword around, and hiding behind a shield, which was sort of not the plan. I wanted to play Dark Souls 2 differently than Dark Souls 1, but then, you know... That also means I have a completely messed up character build that doesn't really make a lot of sense, where I've sort of half-heartedly tried to spec into pyromancy while also insisting on keeping a shield around because sometimes my dodge timings just... I couldn't figure out how to get the dodge timings right and I kept blaming my agility stat because I kept having the feeling that maybe that was the reason why I was dodging so poorly and yet I was also carrying around all these heavy things. Anyway, my point is, I have no freaking idea what I'm doing and I was kind of playing the game poorly. Fortunately though, unlike Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2 offers a solution to that particular problem. If you start off building your character in a way that turns out not to be what you want to play as, if you create a person who's not the kind of person you want to be, at least as far as I understand, still determined as ever, I see. <laughs> Do you wish to start all over again? Dark Souls 2 offers you the ability to remake yourself a little bit. And, for one thing, I'd like to take advantage of that feature at least once because it ties into the central theme that we've been talking about a lot, with Dark Souls being a, a question of personal identity and the malleability of who a person is, like the way that the choices, your choices can define who you become. And also, my build is dumb and I'm annoyed with it and I want to learn to play in a different way. Specifically... Boom. I want to learn to play with the unique feature of this particular video game, which is power stancing. Hey, Future Skyne here, and while Past Skyne is dealing with all of that mess, I'll just take a second here to talk about the idea of something as a game mechanic versus the idea of something as part of a game's narrative. Because here's the thing, I'm sure the respec mechanic is primarily in the game because FromSoft realized that having a respec mechanic in the game would be a nice quality of life change so that you can actually change your character build without having to start the entire game over from scratch. And so when I come in with all of my, ah, this is about personal identity and the malleability of a person's personality and all these kind of extensions readings of what the mechanic could mean, how do you square that with the fact that it probably was just a quality of life change? And the first thing I'll say there is that it can just be both. Like, it can just be, oh, this is a quality of life change, which also does a lot of storytelling for the game. But more specifically, this does come down to, like, the kind of lens with which you approach the game. As we've established many, many times already, I'm primarily approaching Dark Souls 2 through a lens where, like, I'm talking about personal identity, I'm talking about the fluidity of memory and personality, but someone who's doing, like, a Marxist critique of the game will have a very different view on exactly what a Souls mechanic means, because because, well, souls are, after all, literal currency in this game. And similarly, if you're reading the game as a classical hero's journey, you might completely disregard the idea of respecking as nothing more than a game mechanic and completely irrelevant to your understanding. And as usual, there isn't really, like, a right or wrong answer there. There's just different positions and the quality of the arguments you make in favor of them. And so, one of the arguments I would make in favor of my reading that this kind of respect mechanic is actually kind of important to the game is that the narrative and NPCs of Dark Souls have been very, very clear that if you lose all of your souls in this game, you go hollow. Like, souls are a literal measure of how much personality you have, and one of the things that you do with your souls is invest them in yourself. You invest them in your stats, and once you've done that, they can't be taken away from you anymore. You use your personality and your souls to strengthen yourself. So for me, the game is drawing a very direct line between the amount of souls that you accumulate and what what you do with them and the kind of person that you are within the narrative. Like, there's a big difference between being a knight 
and being a sorcerer in the world of Dark Souls. And the only way to be a sorcerer is to put enough of your souls, enough of your personality into your intelligence. So in changing my stats, I am changing who I am. And if, as I suspect, Dark Souls 2 is setting itself up to be at least partly a metaphor for the journey through life, this changing of who you are over the course of that playthrough presents some interesting thematic threads to pull on, because of course we all change over the course of our, as it were, playthrough of life. I'm not the same person I was even five or ten years ago. I'm certainly not the same person I was 20 years ago. And by the same token, in 10 or 20 years' time, I have no idea who I'm going to be. Depending on the challenges that I run into, maybe I'll also find it useful to go back and reallocate some stats, change a few principles about how I approach the world. And when you put it that way, this mechanic becomes something mildly terrifying. <laughs> and so... We enter our new identity as a player, no longer a giant armor dude who hides behind a shield, but something somewhat more light and agile with a thick booty. God damn. Couldn't tell that in the height and eye armor, could you? And now we go looking for a boss against whom I can test myself, by which I mean die a lot in their face because they kill me. And I think I know where to find one. So, th I know those freaking flying gargoyles? Are they gargoyles? Or, like, were they griffins? What were they? I don't remember. I don't know. I don't care. But I know they're here. And since editing the previous videos, I have gained secret forbidden knowledge from beyond the veil of time, realizing, oh, hey, there's a really obvious place that I forgot to go looking for them. And that's where we're going to go now, hopefully, on the assumption that I can find my way there. My legendary pathfinding skills will surely not let me down. Approximately 10 hours later. Uh, I thought they'd be here. Why aren't they here? Because like, this is a servant's quarters. And the only other way to go from the servant's quarters is down, but that leads down to the thing that leads to the... Uh, to the, to the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, um, uh, the, the, the boat, the, the, the pursuer, okay. No, no, no. Oh, hey, standing close to him works. Die. No! Mother <laughs> Mother <laughs> Mother <laughs> Okay. Okay, anyway, round two. There we go. Second time's the charm. And Twinkling Titanite is mine. So there's a Ferris's Lockstone down here thing. Boss ahead, but be wary of Arena. Thank you. Ooh, hello. Ah, I see. So some of them you do have to hit. Belfry, Dark Spirit Ahead, Luna. Uh. Uh, uh, oh, oh. Oh. Oh, okay. I guess that counted as a fuck. Oh, it's a lot of corp. Hello. Hi, how are you? Update! Update! Yes. Oh, I don't like you already. Is he rhyming? Please tell me he's not rhyming. Okay, Dark Spirit, then. That's a lot of corpses lying around. Who the hell... Oh, there he is. Oh, that's a weapon that's on fire. That's not great. 
he's got pyromancy. Hi. Hello. Uh. I take it you're hostile? What the? What? What the f was that? What just happened? Well, that was a little bit bullshit. That there, on the other hand, also looks vaguely like, God f damn it, like a spirit, but I thought it was an NPC spirit, that, that guy, Sanguinara. Cool name. Thanks for killing me, I guess. Oh, Lord Voldemort. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a, that's a player. And he's a sorcerer of some kind. Okay. I just got killed by Lord Voldemort. <laughs> yeah, all right, fine. Okay, I can see that this is going to take a little while. And I guess that's what the message meant when it said, Boss ahead, but beware, arena. Jeez. Okay, so that's... Death? Yeah, but how the hell? Okay, so I need to find a mechanism to open that, I guess. All right. What a thrill When darkness and silence through the night Oh my god! Oh my god. Okay, I guess I found the mechanism. Oh, I rang a bell. Oh, hello again, Lord Voldemort! I guess you're back. Why am I being haunted by Lord Voldemort? No idea what that is. That's a lot of magic! Who the f*** are you? Why? Why? Honestly, why? Leave me alone! I don't know anything about PvP in Dark Souls, by the way. Like, I have no idea what spells he has. I don't know what other players can do. So I imagine if he invades me a third time, which is not, like, beyond reasonable doubt at this point, I'm gonna get royally screwed. Okay, that's open now. Uh, they both had their bows out, I see. Into the fog! Let's go find something else that wants to kill me. Oh! Oh, well, this is a familiar scene. Well, okay, you can attack right out the gate, I see. Oh, there's two of them! Of course there are, I saw multiples of them coming along. Whoa! Do they share a health pool? Oh, yes, I see. Oh, oh, f there's three! Don't be four. Don't be that. Oh, f me sideways. All right. Well, they're slightly less aggressive than the bell gargoyles, at least. Well, this is fun. Okay, uh, I'm gonna need to summon to kill these guys, aren't I? Right. Okay, they can fly up high. They can spit. They, they're the bell gargoyles. They're literally the bell gargoyles again. Mother f Mother f They're the bell gargoyles, but more. <laughs> okay, that was, I, and it's not just that they're kinda like the bell gar, these are the, like you enter the scene, like you enter the arena with those guys, and it's exactly, it's exactly the same. It's not just a little bit the same, it's exactly the same, like, the camera angle is the same, the place you enter the arena is the same as it is with the bell gargoyles. 
And having played Dark Souls 1, I can't help but wonder what the point of the reference is. That's interesting. That was dumb. Hello, summoning sign. Masterless Glencore. Sure. I'll take some help, please. I do like your uh, Zweihander there, my friend. That's, uh, that's a good style option you've got. I'm not fighting three motherfuckers on my own. I'm not doing that. I'm also not leaving behind all those delicious souls. Why is it all the way over there? Is that where I died? Really? Hey, Glenn, anytime! Anytime you want to join, that would be good. That's the fire attack? No. Okay, they also have a dive attack of some sort, I see. Okay. Damn it. Need to do faster attacks. Even with Glenn, I'm not really sure this guarantees a victory. It just means they're going to spend a little time attacking something other than me. Hey, he's doing pretty good against that one. Let's see if we can gank that guy out of existence. What's that? What's that? Why? Why can you do that? Why can you do that? Why? You head. Okay, leave my friend alone, please. Very mean. Very rude. Very ill-behaved. Second hit? No. Oh, sometimes the second hit. Oh, why are there three of them again? Oh my god, is it all of them? Do I have to kill every single last... Is this like a Four Kings deal? I didn't mean to use the Blossom there. Hey, Glenn can heal himself somehow. That's nice. Okay. Well, I guess we're in it for the long haul. Oh, shut your face, you dickhead. Oh, now there's four! Okay! All right! Sure, why not? Okay. No, I didn't actually mean to drink there. I meant to use a Radiant Life Gem. Okay. Ow, sh you! Okay, so looking at their designs, like, one way that they're not like the Bell Gargoyles at all is that the Bell Gargoyles are all weathered and kind of, and kind of all, like, they've clearly been there on the church where you find them for a million years. They're ancient, like, they're, they're, they're all weathered, they're rusty, you can tell that their weapons, like, have seen better days, their, their swords have ired. Um. Yep. Nope. Don't do that. Okay, Glenn, could you heal up, please? No? Okay. Well, maybe I can take on one of them alone. Feel reasonably confident about that? Oh, bad. Not good. Oh, screw you! Why can you dodge? That's my move. <sighs> Was that all of them? Jesus Christ! I'm waiting for one of those to come to life. Okay. All right, Belfry Gargoyles. Hello. Hi, I found you. You're assholes. I don't like you. F*** off. Okay. Well, one good thing is we can look at these ones and get a really good look at their... Oh, that's interesting. Look at that s ornamentation around the spine. That's really pretty. Oh. Well, now I can't get back up. Oh, bonfire. Lovely. Oh, there you are. Oh, it's the lady I gave the clothes to. Hello. I'm here in Medulla, thanks entirely to you. You even were kind enough to clothe me. Thank you so very much. The only thing I can offer is pyromancy. But if that might help you, come to me. 
It was a perilous trek across the mountains. I faced the most frightful things. <laughs> the number of times I nearly died. <laughs> it was a perilous... Okay. Well, she didn't have much dialogue. Oh, right, the souls, the souls, the souls, the souls, the souls, the, 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 the souls. Acquire numerous souls or perhaps, yeah. The elaborate stone statues on the belfry mysteriously came to life. Use the special soul of this living statue. Okay, okay so they mysteriously came to life. So this, so this doesn't tell us much about why they may have come to life. But I bet I know someone who might be able to give us a little bit more information about that. Substrade! Aha! Gargoyle Bident, because of course it's not a trident, it's a Bident. So, a two-pronged spear that imitates a weapon mentioned in an ancient text. Gargoyles, or specifically grotesques, are said to guard castles and forts from ill fortune, and they have appeared in many forms in all the great lands throughout history. Some of them are so meticulously crafted that they look as if they might come to life. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not a sorcerer, you jackass. Hey, if you just got in here to interrupt once again. As you already know from looking at the title of this video, this particular video is a double billing. The Belfry Gargoyles, as it turns out, is not the only boss that I encountered in that particular recording session, who is a very clear and obvious reference to Dark Souls 1. So the ending analysis of this video is going to be all about trying to find the connections between Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 and exploring what they might mean, if indeed they mean anything at all. So right now, in the immediate aftermath of the fight, let's take a quick look at the character designs of the Belfry Gargoyles. So, the first thing to know about the Belfry Gargoyles is that they're not gargoyles. Or rather, they are definitely the monsters that in fantasy media are known as gargoyles, but they're not actually gargoyles in the architectural sense. Now, this is a nitpick that I think I had about the Bell Gargoyles back in Dark Souls 1 as well, but the monstrous carvings and statues that you often find on especially gothic architecture are called grotesques. Now, they're sometimes also known as Chimera because they often depict monsters that seem to be several different animals smashed together, which certainly seems to be true of the Belfry Gargoyles, which have bat or dragon-like wings atop a body that seems more like a combination of some kind of lizard and a cat or a dog. Now, in architecture, a gargoyle is a form of grotesque, but specifically, it's a grotesque that has had a channel carved into it so that it can lead rainwater away from the walls of the building. Typically, the water will be coming out through the mouth of the figure, and the name gargoyle is derived from the French gargouille, which means to gargle, i.e. they're gargling water out of their mouths and leading it away from the building. The reason gargoyles exist is because rainwater flowing down the walls of a building, like for instance a church, can cause a great deal of damage and erosion to the building, so the gargoyles are literally there to protect the architecture. And that typically, too, is the symbolic function of a grotesque. The reason they are designed to look like beasts and monsters is to frighten or ward off evil spirits that might attack the building, or indeed the parishioners held inside of a church. And this certainly seems to be the job of the Belfry Gargoyles, who have these defined spots on the roof of this church building, which they occupy dutifully until some idiot wanders onto their roof and becomes a target. But it does raise a question. For whom are they protecting this roof? It's tempting to say that they must be protecting it for the same princess that the NPC at the beginning of the Belfry Luna mentioned, but, well, he's protecting the bell, and we already got to the bell. In fact, we had to get to the bell in order to get to the Belfry Gargoyles, so what exactly were they protecting? Looking at their soul and the item description of their Bident, the answer to that seems to be... Well, we don't know. All the soul will tell us is that they mysteriously came to life, and all that their bident will tell us is that they are said to guard castles and forts from ill fortune and have appeared in many forms in all the great lands throughout history. Which, of course, immediately leads our attention back to Dark Souls 1. More on that later. But it also does imply that these gargoyles aren't protecting anything for anyone. They're just there and have been there for ages and ages, but no one remembers why or who put them there or what they were even for. Their purpose, the reason for their existence, has been forgotten, as have so many other things in the world of Dark Souls 2. Let's see. Oh, right, I could... There's the... 
I mean, I hesitate to go back there, but... There was that NPC at the start of the PvP area who I didn't actually talk to because I got invaded! And after this, we can either explore the doors of Pharaohs more? Because we've, like, I've, I kind of just barely ran through the area without really checking it out. Or... We could go to some of the other past areas that I don't feel I've explored, like, uh, the, 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 um... A long, long, long time ago, the princess she made me, yes, just like so. I don't like you at all. this bell for the prince's honor. Shut up. Stay away, foul and dead, or you'll be a gonna... Stop rhyming! Stay back! It belongs to the princess, it do! Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wish to guard the bell, you do. No. For the prince, for the princess forever. For true. No. Oh, he's got a cup. Oh, mother. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Fine. Oh, piss off. Okay. So, where do we have to explore? There's the Shaded Woods, which I think I exhausted when I did Nashka. There's the Royal Army Campsite at Brightstone Cove. There's the, sir, the Doors of Pharos. I think we're done with the Forest of Fallen Giants, reasonably sure, but I haven't explored Hyde's Tower much. I think the Lost Bastille is probably exhausted as well. It certainly didn't seem like there was anything else at the Belfry Luna. And I don't think there's anything at No Man's Wharf, but, you know, who can say? Let's go to Hyde. Because... Try range bat. Oh, you mean just shoot that guy from here? Yeah, that would be pretty funny. Because uh, if I remember right... Because, like, I went over here and down and blah 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 and got to the thing. But I'm reasonably sure... There was, like, a path somewhere... That I could have taken, but I didn't. Because, like, I was here... But I don't think I've ever been past this guy. Hi. Excuse me. Nope, I don't think I've been here before. Oh, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, 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 ah! No! <laughs> there sure was something else here. <laughs> uh, that was a drake or a wyvern or something. Okay, there's something else here. I should probably kill the other enemies before... Oh, hey. There it is. I can see it now. So it's lying there and... Guarding a drawbridge? Or can I drop that drawbridge on its head? Hmm. Anyway, f uh. dragon all of a sudden. Now it's just a matter of not dragging 500 people with me when I go and try to deal with that drake, which I guess I have to deal with. I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. Can I just shoot the dragon like 5,000 times from a million miles away? That would be good, I'd like that. It's a saying about sleeping dragons. And it doesn't say to wake them up. Weakness, right leg. Weakness, leg. Oh, no, no, he sees me. He knows I'm here. Hi. Hello. Oh, ho, 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 ho. speaking of fire, probably not the sword's probably not gonna do what I want it to do. Yeah, not really sure how I'm supposed to get close to that. Hi. Yeah, he can stomp. Okay. And also, he can do that! 
where I can't see- Okay, so he just scorches the whole arena multiple times. Okay. I have to kill so many things just to be able to get to the dragon. This would be the way to go. Oh, okay. I'm actually doing pretty good damage to him. Hey! <laughs> okay. I was worried that he was gonna have so much more <laughs> health. Head required a head? Oh, tell me there's a bonfire on the other. That looks like fog door. Oh, that's that's definitely a lot of fog door. The Cathedral of Blue. Hi, hello. Please be nice to me. I will cry. Oh. Wait. What the hell is Ornstein doing here? And why is his armor all gray? Hi, Ornstein! Oh, that's not... That's not lightning anymore, though. That's something else. So maybe it's not Ornstein, but someone else wearing the same armor? Like someone from the same... Order? And not all of his attacks are exactly the same, but this is the Hall in an Orlando. Like, that's what this is. Very explicitly. I got hit. I got hit. Even the music sounds kind of similar. Hi. Uh, not sure why you're pissed at me, but all right. Old Dragon Slayer, huh? And we met a dragon right before we... Which reminds me, actually, the Dragon Rider. I commented on him that he was a rider without a dragon. But I guess we found his dragon? Uh, that was not a good, good heal. Come on, attack. Oh, you're faster than I like. I'm dead. Yeah. Well, hello, Ornstein-ish. Or someone wearing extremely similar armor, using extremely similar moves. So we've talked about how the Belfry Gargoyles are... Effectively... A reference to Dark Souls 1 in a lot, or rather it's like a repeat of the same thematic idea. So here again we see a, a clear homage to an iconic part of Dark Souls 1, which is the Hall of Anne Orlando where you fight Ornstein and Smau. But what's interesting is, be wary of familiar but darkness ahead. Uh, thanks Fume Knight, I don't know what that means. Hi, dude. My roll timing is off. It's completely off. It's like I react way too slow. Ah, third hit, of course. I might die before I get to recover, uh, reclaim. That would be bad. Thank you. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Oh, that's the bot stomp! He even has that! Ah! Ugh. Damn it, should've known. Okay. Slowly figuring him out, but... So the thing I can't help but think is... The Belfry Gargoyles Arena... ...was like the one that you face at Dark Souls 1, but it was smaller. Like, it was a much smaller arena, which is part of what made it so difficult to deal with. And now we're facing not Ornstein and Smau, golden warriors plated in all the splendor of Anorlando, but one old dragon slayer in a much smaller arena. Like, a, a tiny version of what Anorlando used to be. And we already, like, when we, when we first went through this place, 
I kind of talked about that this kind of seemed like an Orlando, but for this game, like this is that glorious representation of a fallen empire, right? And so I can't help but wonder if what's being set up here is, if this is related to the idea of the, like the cycle of, of flame and rekindling and stuff, in the sense that the world becomes less and less, ah, f damn it, I rolled though. Like the world is, is constantly diminishing which is what we talked about at the end of, of, of Dark Souls 1, is like that the idea of the world, like the diminishing returns of rekindling the flame and the world growing less and less uh, vital and vibrant and, and how life will slowly fade out of it. No swing overhead, okay. He's got such long range on that bullet. I'm gonna have to use an effigy soon. Can I summon any, any NPCs to help me fight this guy? That would actually be interesting. I feel like I won't need it, but... Like, he feels manageable. I just need to learn his attack timings and not get hit so much. See, like that, where I feel overconfident that I have a, room, a space to hit him in, when in fact I don't. Come on, do a move so I can heal, you jerk. Thank you. Third time's the charm! Gotcha. Because look at this. Like, this, this... We'll look at his soul in a second. This is an Orlando. Like, it's the same principle. It's it's the great hall with the pillars and the statues of the so or of some ancient hero or sovereign at the end and all that cathedral glory, but so much smaller. First, I want to look at the ring and I want to look at the soul. Where is it? Nashka, Belfry, Dragon Slayer. The old Dragon Slayer is reminiscent, ah, of a certain knight that appears in old legends. Reminiscent. So the game is not outright confirming it. Hmm. Interesting. The beloved ring of a dragon slaying knight strengthens thrust weapon counterattacks. So that's the Leo ring from Dark Souls 1? Hmm. After many years of use, the ring's face has worn down, but close inspection in reveals an engraved lion. Okay, so the game is providing us with some ambiguity, whether this is actually Ornstein or not. But it's also playing into the possibility that it could be him, on the assumption that he has lived long enough to see the rise of whatever the hell this civilization is, and on the assumption that Drang Lake is founded on the ruins of Lordran. Hmm. So, uh... Transient being. Well, he's not hollow. This is no place for one such as you. Be gone. You are not needed. Indeed. Transient be- You would never make a knight of the blue. And I have nothing more to say. Be gone. You are not needed. Hurrah for gorgeous view. It is. I can't help but... Like, look at those parapets out there. Those flying buttresses. It's very like an Orlando, isn't it? Okay. Don't know what the deal is with that guy. So I'm gonna see if there's a bonfire down here somewhere. Listen carefully, monster ahead. We're off a bonfire, okay. But something clearly also killed a few people down here. But that guy was fighting something that came from up the stairs. Same thing with that guy. Hmm, the Blue Cathedral. Presumably this is connected to the Knights of the Blue, I have to imagine. 
Can't help but feel like maybe Ornstein showing up here is a slight, a little bit of, ah, sh we have to do a new character model. Can't we just use an old one? Change the colors a bit? <laughs> do, do a bit of a palette swap? <laughs> but I'll leave it up to um, Future Sky and to figure out exactly what and how the existence of Ornstein might meet for Dark Souls 2. Well, thank you very much, Pascai, and... Uh, okay, fine. We're gonna have to do it, aren't we? We're gonna have to deal with Dark Souls 1 and the canonical sequel connection. Now, this is a question that I've been reluctant to tackle for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I'm not very interested in it. Dark Souls 2, so far, to a large extent, seems to be mostly interested in doing its own thing, and doesn't seem to be commenting on or engaging with any of the same themes, really, that Dark Souls 1 was centered around. As we've talked about before, Dark Souls 1 is largely a mythology of a dying world. It's concerned with the state of the fire and the death of Lordran and the fate of the king, and you, the player, as a chosen faded hero on whose decisions the fate of the world will turn. Dark Souls 2, as we've discussed extensively by contrast, is much more interested in the player as an individual. This is much more your story rather than being the story of the fate of Drang Lake. Consequently, we haven't really had characters talking much about the linking of the flame or the dying of the world. I think, in fact, the first character who really substantively brought up the idea of the fire is Macduff, who seems singularly obsessed with it, but nobody else seems to be particularly concerned with the state of fire. They are all much more concerned with the state, use, and nature of souls. Still, all the same, the game has been dropping hints throughout the playthrough already that there is a direct connection to Lordran in Drang Lake. And now, with the presence of the Belfry Gargoyles, who are, in a very literal sense, a remix of the Bell Gargoyles, and literally Ornstein, in an arena that seems to be a replica in miniature of the hall in An Orlando, where I first fought him and Smau, who was blessedly not present for this particular fight. It does become impossible to say that there's no connection between Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. And so the question that that leaves us with is, what does that mean? And there's basically two approaches you can take to answering that question. You can either say that Dark Souls 2 is its own self-contained experience, and that any references to Dark Souls 1 that show up are little more than Easter eggs that are not meant to be taken too seriously. The other approach you can take is to say that Dark Souls 2 is a clear continuation of Dark Souls 1, and that the two games have a strong thematic relationship and have something to say about each other. Now, the trouble for me with that second approach is that currently, I have the context of all of Dark Souls 1, which I completed, but only the context of, like, maybe half of Dark Souls 2, perhaps not even that. And so it's really hard for me to see if there are any broad narrative arcs from Dark Souls 1 that are clearly being carried on in the narrative or meta-narrative of Dark Souls 2. I just don't have enough context to really parse that out yet. Now, that's not to say I can't make some educated guesses here, because Dark Souls 1 and 2 both are concerned with the cyclical nature of existence and the idea of inevitable decay. In Dark Souls 1, this takes the form of the linking of the flame and the dying age of fire and so on, and the decision about whether to rekindle and continue the cycle over again. In Dark Souls 2, the idea of cycles and decay are explored through the personal rather than the social and societal. The flame is not the power source that sustains the world, the flame is the power source that sustains you, specifically your soul. The entire game, at least insofar as it's been described to us so far, is about finding a way to avoid ultimately going hollow, much in the same way that Dark Souls 1, in some respects, is about finding a way to avoid the world going, air quotes, hollow, as it were, by either falling to the Age of Dark or, depending on your interpretation, getting stuck in an endlessly repeating cycle of diminishing returns by constantly rekindling the Age of Fire. So yes, I could certainly make the argument that there's thematic overlap between the two games, that they're just two different perspectives on exploring the same question. One of them interrogating the process of keeping a certain state of society going, and the other interrogating the process of keeping a certain state of personhood going. Similarly, both games posit that the way to keep either your own personal cycle or the cycle of the world going is through sacrifice. Sacrifice of yourself or sacrifice of others to your purposes. All of that being said, though, 
I just don't find that angle of interpretation very compelling, because in the extreme, you end up in a situation where each game can only say something meaningful if that thing is connected to something that is said or happens in the other games. Like, each game is only meaningful insofar as it contributes to the overarching lore of the Dark Souls mythos, and any specific thing that each game individually is trying to express or is trying to explore or interrogate kind of gets erased or overlooked when the lens that you are approaching the game with is what can this game say about the other ones. Which of course leads us back to the first approach that I detailed a million years ago before I went off on this tangent. Let's assume that Dark Souls 1 means nothing to Dark Souls 2. Let's assume that Dark Souls 1 just didn't happen, and that the Belfry Gargoyles and the old Dragon Slayer, rather than being references to a previous game, exist as completely unique individuals within Dark Souls 2. In other words, Let's pretend we're playing this game completely blind, without even the context of the first game in the series. Now, we've already talked about how the Bell Gargoyles are creatures from some forgotten previous age who persist in their purpose to protect the building that they're stationed on, but the people or the institutions in whose service they were protecting the buildings are long since gone. The Dragon Slayer, then, is something rather similar, starting with the fact that he doesn't have a name, just a title. The Old Dragon Slayer. Like the Dragon Rider before him, his personal identity is completely subsumed by his job. And this is kind of literalized in the Old Leo Ring, the description of which reads, After many years of use, the ring's face has worn down, but close inspection reveals an engraved lion. The engraving, the identity of the ring, has been worn away by years and years and years of service to a purpose. Which of course leads my thoughts back to that central threat at the heart of Dark Souls 2. You will lose all your souls. You will go hollow. You will lose who you are, your identity, your memories. That's the nature of the curse that we've been fighting this whole time. And that's the curse that, at least from that particular perspective, has already claimed the old Dragon Slayer, and the Lost Sinner, and the Pursuer, and the Dragon Rider, and the Last Giant, and even Scorpionus Nashka's story is about losing a person that you used to be to the encroaching madness of a cursed existence. Now, as Past Skyn already mentioned before he threw to me, it's also possible that Ornstein's character model was just reused because it was a convenient asset and it was a way to put a boss in a position where they wanted a boss to be. And then they added the references back to Dark Souls 1 as a kind of Easter egg to reward and delight any Dark Souls 1 players who might be playing the sequel. But that, to me, would be the least interesting way to interpret this character. Anyway, to wrap a bow around this, yes, of course, it's entirely possible and indeed plausible to view the Bell Gargoyles and the Old Dragon Slayer as either homage or Easter egg or direct reference to Dark Souls 1. And certainly Dark Souls 2 has at this point established itself as being part of the canon of Dark Souls 1, i.e. we are in some later cycle of the kindling of the flame, but how much that really means to the narrative of Dark Souls 2, well, that's a matter of interpretation and there are multiple valid answers. My particular interpretation, of course, is not very much. Hey, thank you very much for watching another episode of the Boss Designs of Dark Souls 2. This was another double billing, which is something that we're going to be doing again, because in the recording session where I recorded this footage, I also encountered a couple of other bosses that are probably best dealt with in a joined video. That does mean that the editing process gets longer and more difficult to deal with, but... I have only myself to blame for that. Anyway, if you enjoy the boss designs of Dark Souls 2, I would greatly appreciate a like down below the video, maybe also a comment and a subscribe, because that makes numbers go up, and numbers going up is the only metric that YouTube will accept as an argument for why they should let me keep doing what I'm doing. If you want to support the channel more directly, I do have a Patreon, and I have some tip jars down in the description, as well as a merchandise store. Of course, if money is a little bit tight for you right now, I completely understand Christmas is coming up. It's tight for everybody. The one thing I'll encourage you to do, though, is if there is an online content creator whose work you enjoy, whatever they do, like whether it's videos or comics or whatever it may be, if you have an online content creator whose work you enjoy, whether that's me or someone else, 
please consider supporting them directly with literally anything you can. Especially with Christmas coming up soon, times are gonna be a bit tough for online content creators, especially small ones, because Christmas entails Christmas presents and traveling to see your family and just generally speaking, taking a holiday. And online content creators generally don't get paid holidays. We lose work time. And generally speaking, December, January, and February are also kind of just slow months for online content in general. It's New Year's, there's tax season to think about, donations tend to slow down, Patreon support tends to slow down. So if you are in a position where you have a little bit of extra money and you don't mind giving it away to someone else, find an online content creator whose work you enjoy and send them a dollar, like if you have it. And if you're not gonna get yourself in any trouble giving it away, online content creators, especially the smaller ones, could really use the assistance. Of course, if you're not in a position to be able to afford to do that, that's completely okay. Please don't feel guilty about it. Please don't feel sad about it. Take care of yourself first. This is only for people who have a couple of extra dollars lying around and who can comfortably give it away without negatively affecting themselves. Anyway, if you haven't enjoyed this video, well, ancient legends do tell of an artifact that can allow you to register such displeasure with the powers that be. Once, many centuries ago, in a land far, far from here, great craftsmen forged a magical trinket of unimaginable power. So great was its might that it was able to banish entire YouTube channels from the recommendation pages of ordinary people. The content creators of long ago online times lived in abject fear of its terrible power, and its name was spoken of barely in whispers. The dislike button. Time, however, took its inevitable toll on the power of the dislike button after thousands of years of continuous use. Its location and its terrible powers faded out of the memories of the common folk. It became little more than a scary bedtime story for young content creators. Ooh, if you don't upload your video on schedule, the dislike button will get you. Today, it is little more than a forgotten boogeyman. But there are those ancient tomes and legends that tell that should you go searching for it, should you hear the call of that dark and terrible power, it will answer you. But whatever terrible price you must pay for wielding such a power, none are left now alive who can tell.